three times in our history, an American military force has been utterly annihilated by its enemies. And each time, those enemies were sued. Surely the sun never shone on a more heroic people, magnificently plumed, uncompromisingly brave, like the eagle. From the cradle to the grave, the Sioux lived to transcend the natural world in which the great spirit had placed him. His legacy was liberty. He was born to strength and bred for valor, like the eagle. Yes, this was the Sioux, who in the 19th century was master of that mighty domain stretching from Minnesota to the mountains of the West. This was the eagle culture, which barred the path of westward progress to our young and growing nation. In the years immediately following the war between the states, the Sioux nation was in full flower. Its small villages were strung like gleaming beads across the plains, transient communities of a migratory people who followed the buffalo, their single source of life. Whole families moved with incredible ease to new villages and new hunting grounds, using the horse and the travois to take them and all their worldly goods. These warriors and their families came in peace, bearing the symbol of peace. And so were they received, even as brothers among brothers and children to the chief. The warrior hunted to feed his family and fought to defend them. Anything less than these labors was woman's work. The man selected the site of his teepee, accomplished the ritual that blessed it in the eyes of the great spirit, and left the remaining details to the women. Meanwhile, the men of each family new to the village paid their respects to the chief. Before the tall central teepee, with symbols of wisdom and authority spread before it, they smoked the ceremonial pipe together. Tobacco to the Sioux was the fountainhead of fellowship, the sacred substance which softened hearts, making neighbors of men and brothers of neighbors. With this pipe, they created a climate of trust, spoke soundlessly yet eloquently of peace, asking the while that heaven and earth give witness to the bond thus formed. In the summer of 1875, the western villages of the tribe were at peace. War bonnet and lance slept in the thick sunshine, and time, like the clouds, drifted noiselessly by. The squaws dried the meat of yesterday's kill while their men, today, were back on the buffalo trail. And the women were busy with other things, too. Things deeply rooted in the life of the people. Things that soothed the eye and warmed the heart. These the women did so that beauty, too, might reside in the austere fabric of their lives. Above all, it was in beadwork that these women excelled. With the instinct for design and the sensitivity to color peculiar to her race, the Sioux squaw took infinite pains to string an exquisite quality about the most common of household objects. The old people and the children also remained in camp. And one old man kept the winter count. This was a history of the people used for the instruction of the young. On a buffalo hide were recorded significant events that kept the Sioux in touch with their past and shaped their decisions for the future. But for the Sioux, all decisions, past and present, 
were bound up with the buffalo. As they could kill this quarry, so could they live. Its meat sustained them, its hide sheltered them. Its very leavings were their source. Because of the advance of the white man, the great herds were diminishing. Carefully, the hunters circled the drifting herd, working their way behind the ridges until the wind was in their favor. By now, they had a lone bull as their quarry. the bull they wanted. They would have to hit him hard and together in a vital place with great power behind each arrow. The great spirit had guided one arrow to the soft throat of the bull and dropped him. Without the strength that came from this heavenly source, this power greater than themselves, the tribe could not endure. It was during the cool summer nights that the Great Spirit seemed closest to his people. His presence hovered on the fringe of the campfires, drawn there by the drum of the medicine man, who invoked him to bring his infinite strength to bear that the stricken might be cured. Even the bravest of warriors trembled at the sound of that drum. For this music awoke the unknown, set the troubled forces of the night to brooding, endowed even dead objects with irresistible power. Thus did the medicine man purge the sickness in men, stifling it through fear, grinding it beneath the weight of the night, which only he could wield. The great spirit cast other kinds of spells, less terrifying but equally disturbing, in the hearts of even the bravest of warriors. The most common of these was that uncommon sensation called love. The Sioux, whose maidens were by reputation among the loveliest on the plains, had a traditional form of courtship. It occurred most often at the watering place, where the gentle sounds of water could be counted on to lull the beloved's resistance. And the young suitor, so much more skillful in pursuing a buffalo than a bride, could rely on a more expressive instrument to speak for his heart. Traditionally, the Sioux maiden gave no sign of hearing anything more significant than the wistful murmur of the water, the sighing of the wind in the weeds, and perhaps the senseless shrilling of a stray bird. But traditionally, for she was a woman, she had heard quite enough. That sad solo was the prelude to her victory. The warrior received permission to propose to her only after he presented her father with horses stolen from an enemy tribe. And her answer, yes. The day of the wedding feast was set, and now the bride-to-be prepared herself. She bathed in a pure spring-fed lake where so many brides before her had come to be cleansed. And on the morning of her wedding day, they dressed her placing the lovely moccasins on her feet that her mother had made for this moment, parting her hair with a combing stick with exquisite care, and speaking to her as bridesmaids have spoken since the dawn of life on earth.
At the wedding feast, relatives and friends wore their finest eagle feathers, beaded moccasins, and porcupine quill vests. Indeed, it was a splendidly happy occasion for everyone but the bride and groom, who, like all such couples everywhere, nervously suffered through it. On such occasions, food was prepared in a buffalo paunch, which not only held water, but contributed its flavor. Red hot stones were dropped in to bring the water quickly to a boil. Then chunks of meat were added and were cooked in a matter of minutes. The finest old utensils were used for serving, carved long ago by a master craftsman and handed down across the generations. And afterwards, they expressed their happiness in the way they knew best. Such joyous occasions called for the rabbit dance. Simple, spontaneous, and yet subtle in its rhythms. It was the custom that bride and groom did not participate, and a kindly custom indeed, for both were too shy at that moment to move even their eyes. Then there was the execution of the marriage contract. No document was written, no word spoken, but the father of the bride and the father of the groom, in the presence of their children, smoked together of one pipe, and by this act, sealed the union of their houses. In recognition of the solemnity of the moment, they lay before them their most treasured heirlooms, their ceremonial tobacco pouches. This done, the women escorted the bride to her husband's teepee, a stately procession steeped in symbolic values. Here was a triumphal march, marking the victory of order over chaos in the warrior society. Here was the promise of enduring life for the eagle culture. In the spring of 1876, the word of war traveled like the north wind among the villages of the Sioux, freezing hearts and hardening the resolve of the chiefs. There was no road left to honor or survival but the warpath. Messengers shuttled like a strong stitch between the villages, weaving the war party together bringing news of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and their plans, news that the Cheyenne would fight beside their Sioux brothers, and the news that white cavalry under Custer was on the march, set the Sioux camps to stirring, set the warriors to sharpening their eyes, their arrows, and their hearts for the battle yet unborn. The bright days that followed were stained by ominous smoke signals, bearing word of the approaching enemy. Women trembled as everywhere in all places, in all times, when the thunderheads of war gather on the horizon. The signals spoke of a great war party gathering to defend the land at the Little Big Horn. And on June 25th, 1876, the combined forces of Crazy Horse met the United States Cavalry under General George Custer at the Little Bighorn River and destroyed them. The Sioux won the great battle, but lost their war with the westward progress of civilization. The eagle fell before an even greater eagle, the bird which symbolized a young nation spreading its wings across a continent, its eyes on tomorrow. The eagle which withstood the shock of Custer's cavalry fell before the meshing of gears and the forward flow of machinery. It fell to the Dakota earth, not before the carbine, but before the combine. Not war, but wheat was the Sioux's undoing. Today, the Sioux live in an area bounded by the Black Hills, 
fringed by the sun-blasted badlands and along the serpentine and sand-clogged Missouri River. They live in the shadow of Mount Rushmore, democracy's shrine permanently engraved on the Dakota Hills. They live in the shadow of an ideal. The eagle has fallen out of the light and into the shadows, and there is pathos in his plight. For these are the deep shadows of poverty and bewilderment. The reservation lands are bleak and unyielding, and these descendants of a gypsy-like people, these once proud wielders of the lance, have never taken to the plow. They are a restless, unhappy people, constantly seeking a place in the sun. Today, at most Western shows, the Sioux can be found drawn by the holiday spirit, the color, the excitement which go to the heart of their past and contrast so sharply with the drabness of their present. Pathetic the plight of an eagle who drags his feathers in the dust, adding local color to the carnival tamely walking in the wake of heroes, silently observing that quality which is his own legacy, that quality called courage. the Sioux through the trials of transition, the United States government has established reservations in the Dakotas. Here a genuine effort is made to encourage the people to maintain their arts and crafts, both for aesthetic and commercial reasons. Sioux beadwork is prized by the connoisseur, for though masculine in spirit, it is delicately beautiful and worth owning. Thus it brings an income to the tribe. It is fine work, truly indigenous, and it goes with good things. At reservations like Rosebud, the government endeavors to minister to the health of a people who have not fared well physically in their transition from a hunting to an agricultural way of life. Infant mortality, long one of the chronic problems in the life of the Sioux, has steadily been reduced. Economically, the government has in many instances succeeded in putting the Sioux in the cattle business. Certainly no people could be more at home on horseback or more thoroughly trained for the open range. But the obstacles to success are many. Among them, insufficient grazing areas, soil erosion, and complex problems in land ownership. And yet the Sioux today finds hope veritably at his feet. His hope is a flowing thing, the Missouri. It was along this river that the white man first found him and named him. And now the Missouri has become his promise of a place in the sun. For the nation which conquered him is today engaged in conquering the river, erecting huge dams like Fort Randall, like Fort Peck and Angostura. One day these dams will lace the land with power, will generate enormous capable of lighting homes, controlling floods, irrigating earth, Yes, and raising a fallen people to their feet. The Missouri Valley will become an industrial area, a new undergirding of strength for America, and a new source of opportunity for Americans red as well as white. Progress which destroyed the Sioux now gives promise of restitution.
Thus, a people living in the shadow of an ideal have found that a blessing can rise from the rubble. And that blessing goes beyond the harnessing of a river. It is the great good which must come to all men whose government is dedicated in act as well as in principle to the preservation of the dignity of man.